Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a group run by Warren Jeffs, which I moved out of when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for almost eight years and have two beautiful babies. Yes. And today we have a special guest, Eskel Grant. What's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Thank we're, you for being here. Yeah, we're so excited. Um, some of you may know his older sister, Amanda Ray, and her YouTube channel. And Eskel has now newly started his own channel. What's the name of your channel? It's Eskel Grant. It's spelled E-S-K-E-L, and then my last name, Grant. Yeah, it's super unique, so if you even just type in those first five letters, then I come right up. So. Not a lot of Eskels out there, huh? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to hear more of what it is like for Sam to grow up in polygamy, and go and subscribe and like mm -hmm. on Eskel's channel as well. Like and subscribe, and you'll get to hear more about what it was like for all of them. Yes, oh, yeah. for today, we are very excited to have Eskel here. Uh, he has... He comes from the Kingston group. Uh, we've had his sister Amanda on here and have sh shared some of her stories, but it's mm -hmm. going to be very interesting to see the differences that it, uh, that it was for the men versus the women in that group. Oh, yeah. Major differences. For and sure. I'm personally excited to get to ask questions and see the similarities and the differences between the men in the Kingston group and the way the men in the FLDS groups, like what their roles were, what was yeah. expected, and what you guys were taught. So comparing the men's roles to me, I'm like really excited for that as well. Awesome. <laughs> Well, sounds great. Well, let's get right into it then. Yeah, we're basically, let's just start at the beginning. So where did you grow up and what was your, what did your family look like? Like how many mothers? And... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, I grew up in West Valley City, right in, right close to Salt Lake City in Utah. That's kind of where the order, I guess the main base is for it all. And my family, I mean, I consider it pretty average size, but it's, it's large for most people. But I am the fourth child of 10 altogether. So okay. 10 that come directly from my mom. Okay. And then if you count all the siblings, there's 32 of us. Okay. Together. So, so similar, actually, to my family. I mean, my mother has 12, and then there's 35 of us uh, full-blooded and half siblings. Yeah. I was just going to ask, are those all from the same father? Yep. Every okay. single one of them. Okay. okay. Interesting. Okay. So starting off pretty similar to me so far. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you grow up? Uh, one thing that I had heard was a difference is in the Kingston group, did you all live in the same house? Like Sam grew up with all the mothers in the same place and with their father. Ooh. How was your, like, what does your family look like as far as living situations? It was very different because at least for me, like I, I, I did consider them having three moms and like they were my moms, but they, I knew my moms didn't get along super well, so that okay. would have been really hard, all of us living in one house. So I'm glad we did not have that. Were the moms able to be yeah. vocal about that? Like, were they vocal about the fact they didn't get along? Uh, well, I mean, they don't try to be, but it's pretty obvious. Anyone oh, okay. that keeps an eye out. <laughs> yeah. Sure. See, the, the in my family, the moms kind of had to keep everything... Looking like it looking was like it was fine, mm -hmm. and if they did have any concerns, they just had to kind of sweep it under the rug because they weren't allowed mm -hmm. to really speak up about things like that. Mm -hmm. They were just okay. supposed to be obedient and do what they were supposed to do. And but we all did live in the same house together. All the moms, that is wild. one big family. We knew who our moms were, uh, mm -hmm. of course, but I was closer to some of my half siblings than I was to my full blooded because they were closer wow. in age. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. definitely, that definitely different in that aspect. Yeah, and for me, like we would all come together for like Christmas or big events, and I, we'd sleep over all the all thirty two of us in one house. And I remember it was just such a relief when we got to go home after all that because oh, <laughs> wow. it would just be a mess, and it would just be so much happen. And it was fun. I remember the first like going to visit them and like spending that time with them was a blast because I was just a kid. I would yeah. add to all of the messes and <laughs> so yeah. just have a ton of fun. But then having to, being able to go home and have my at least only less kids, I guess, yeah. was just a nice break. <laughs> only sure. 10 kids in the house yeah. felt yeah. like a relief. Very peaceful. <laughs> Very peaceful with only 10, right? <laughs> uh -huh. so, each, so each of the mothers had their own home. Mm -hmm. Did your yeah. father have his own home as well or did he rotate between the homes? He just rotated. He basically, his home was the trunk of his car. <laughs> he, I remember wow. him opening his trunk and he'd have like all of his clothes and just pretty much he lived out of his car and would just take the things they needed to each house. I think the goal was because like he kept on talking about wanting to have three of everything and like if he had enough money, he would probably just have three of everything and keep everything at each of the homes. Hmm. But at least in the meantime, he just, anything that he couldn't, he would just take with him in his car. So Interesting. Wow. So there wasn't like a favorite mother that he would, that he would spend more time in one specific house? Oh yeah. There was definitely favorites and okay. there was 
you know, this there was always one wife that had the nicer house, the bigger house and stuff. Uh, and so I'm sure he always No wonder they stuff. always they were they were fighting then. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Did that and, ever get swapped? Like your dad gets in a fight with one of the wives and he's like, You move into the nicer house. Well, not quite that way, but I did see a lot of the times where if a certain wife was maybe being like on a better behavior or being really good, then it did seem like she got more of the nicer things. And I think my situation was a little bit unique because it was pretty well known. And maybe I'm biased on this, but I thought it was very well known that my mom was kind of like the favorite wife. So I remember like thinking that we did have a little bit nicer stuff than a lot of my Mm. half siblings and other people and stuff like that. And I mean... I don't, I, it wasn't always like that. There were some times like where the first wife did have the bigger home and have the nicer stuff uh, for a while. And maybe like she was the favorite for a time period or something, you know? Hmm. And so, and I think they, they don't like pick, oh, this was my favorite and that. It's just kind of like they do what they want, you know? If they yeah. feel like giving this person more stuff or if they're being nicer to them, there's not really like rules or regulations. So it just kind of whatever happens, happens. And how... How close together were these houses that the different wives stayed in? Was it all within a Mm -hmm. similar area or were they scattered around the city? They were kind of scattered because the only rule is really you got to be within the close enough to go to church, you know, you have to be able to go to church every Sunday. So at one point we like my mom really wanted like begged and begged for a nice bigger house and she finally got it. But in order for us to afford it, it was like really far out. So we had to commute and drive, I think it was like 45 minutes to basically anything, any order event, any, any like church or just any dances was a lot of driving for sure. Wow. wow. And so everyone in the, in the Kingston group or that belonged to the church would all meet in the same meeting house each Sunday? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it, the, it was a pretty central area for all of you? Yeah. I mean, well, because we built our lives around that, you know, it's mm. like you honestly, for the majority of like Kingston history, you, it's not an option to be a part of the Kingston group and live out of state or, or different things. They're trying to do that more now. They technically have another branch and I think it's Pennsylvania or something, you know, oh, wow. but it's just really small. And for the most part, you have to be there within Interesting. that area. So. About how many members, if it was all in one meeting house, about how many members do they have? Well, for most of my growing up, it was only about three to 5,000. Uh, they say now that I've been talking to them, it's closer to like nine to 10,000 because it's grown. Most of them are just a lot of babies, but I mean, there, there's only been like two families that have, that weren't born into it that have joined. So oh, wow. it grows, so it grows very small. So it grows strictly from from them having their kids Uh, Mm -hmm. that's very interesting and very similar to the flds Mm -hmm. i know of two actually three converts to the church okay uh, but that's it Mm -hmm. it was very uncommon and do they have to pay a fee to join because i know the order has a fee for anyone that joins really a religious base and they still make them pay to join and, and like a one time a one time fee? fee or a tithing well i mean they have to pay tithing that's just the regular though everyone does that right. but then to join you have to pay a fee just to join the kingston group what was the fee uh you know? i've heard different numbers from everyone but the most common number right here is the five thousand dollars to join per person too so if like so like if you have a family would you have to pay five thousand dollars per child too i don't know exactly but from what they what i've heard then yeah it's per person so did, oh, they, did they ever tell you what the fee was for? That's what I was going to ask. Um, I mean, like they did, did talk about like it's a membership fee. Like like you're joining a cult, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't say it like that, but it's like to be, to get your place as a member. Like, Interesting. That is so unique. Like, I feel like most of the time people get brought into these small groups or small religions or cults or whatever you want to call them, and they get dragged in emotionally and then they start asking for things, but to like be straight up right from the beginning and be like, just so for you know, you to be able to even get to be with us, you've got to pay up. Mm-hmm. You got to wonder if that helps or hurts. I mean, I guess if there's not, well, I'm sure it hurts. Yeah, yeah. They only get like the two people. So, per year. <laughs> so. I just, that, that is so interesting. And it, does the church provide a lot of stuff for the people or is it just the teachings? No, it's like, um, a virus when you just suck everything out of the people oh. kind of. that's oh, why because wow. they are a business you know they everything they do is to get something other than you know they if you if you go at it with purely a spiritual perspective that's like sure you're gaining your salvation so yeah i'll give you my money my time everything to go to heaven i guess so to order members it's like it's worth it and yeah it takes a lot from the people 
but you get something you can't get anywhere else. But from an outside perspective, it's like it looks so much like a virus. You're just sucking everything out of people. Yeah, they have to pay to even just be involved in it. Then they have to commit to their 10%. Then they have to commit all their time and their talents and just do everything they tell them to. It's like, Jeez. that's a lot to ask. So for the tithing, I'm curious because growing up LDS, we pay 10% of our income mm -hmm. and it's just flat. That's what you paid consistently year round. The FLDS, they had like tithing calls where it wasn't 10%. They just, whenever they asked for it, you had to give them money. What was it like for the Kingston group? Like what did tithing look mm. like? Well, from what I understood from it, it was 10% of just any time you money goes in, like even a dollar, if you're putting in a dollar, they would just take 10% of that. Cause they would always say, even, when you would get paid cash, if you just did like, I don't know, a construction job or something, they would say, take that money, turn it into the order bank, and then take the money out and go buy your stuff. That way you would turn it in, they take 10% and then give you it back after they took the 10%. This is so sounding you had, wait a minute, okay. for me, okay. You had a bank? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. like not like a real official bank, but like the orders bank, yeah, they had their own. Okay, tell so, me more. So this, is, this is starting to sound familiar. This is starting to sound a little bit like the the church storehouse in the FLDS, where okay, yeah. where the members were forced to give everything to the church storehouse, mm -hmm. and then the storehouse would kind of decide what they got. Yeah, it's very similar. In fact, I mean, I don't know exactly when this transition happened, but it, it used to be a storehouse because if you go farther enough back in in the uh, Kingston history then it was just a storehouse and it was 100% and they, they still technically do 100% but you do 10% where you don't get like they don't even keep the record of it from you you know that you turn $100 they take 10% you have $90 that technically shows that you contributed $90 right so they could keep track of how much you can ask for when you ask for money for to buy whatever you know but then you still technically have to commit that ninety dollars the other 100 percent to be consecration that they try to live too so they yeah. they still do both of it but. okay so you make a hundred dollars and you put it into their bank mm -hmm. and then you do you have to like fill out a slip or something when you want well, and you want to buy a car Mm -hmm. yeah, Are they so they, keeping a tally and then you say, can I get $5,000 to buy this car? Or do they give you the $90 back and you keep it in a regular bank account and you save up for your car? No, you keep it in there. They have this thing called a statement. So it's almost like a little bit like a bank account. It says, so like you would put in $100 and then your statement will say you have $90 that so shows that you contributed $90. So you could okay. essentially ask for that $90 back but if they don't have it then of course they can always deny it at any time because you sign your consecration form saying that it's all the orders it's everyone's money is in one pot one bank account but they do keep a statement saying who contributed how much because you know people that contribute more than they're more lenient about letting them take some out and stuff like that yeah. so they do keep a tally on everything that you do wow. gotcha. so can they just say no whenever they want if they think you're being too frivolous like if you're like i oh, want to yeah. buy it's a new pair of Oakley's. It's and they'd be like, no, you don't need Oakley's. Oh, yeah. It, and it's less now, but especially when I was younger, I remember them announcing, like, this Christmas, don't buy too many gifts, don't spend too much. Like, like I, I don't know what it was for, but my thought is maybe the order invested in something and lost a lot of money or something, you know? Uh, so they were, there would be time periods where they'd be like, don't spend a lot of money. Whereas they claim, now that I still talk to a lot of the members there, they say it's way less like that. They're a lot more lenient. But they still, they still say no. There's rarely any order members that drive really nice cars and stuff because you ask and then they'll consider that a luxury and they, they'll easily say no so so who's uh, they like who what who's who's making these decisions is there i know you have your leader is he mm -hmm. called a prophet oh yeah definitely the oh. prophet paul <laughs> okay the prophet paul so you have yeah. your prophet paul is and then counselors? who's who's yep. beneath mm -hmm. him he's got his there's kind of like the top three he, he's at the very top and then he has his two closest brothers that help mm. him. And if you think about it, though, it's kind of like there are five of his brothers that he gives a lot of authority and power to. And those are known as like the five main leaders, the, the five main families of the whole organization and everything. Wow. So are there Are there apostles like there are in the LDS? Because for those of you who aren't familiar with the LDS church, it, you have a prophet. He has two counselors, a first counselor and a second counselor. And then you have the 12 apostles. Um, and then there's continues to be very organized structured leadership below obviously the lds church is a lot bigger than the kingston or the flds so the structure goes down well, a lot further not only the structure going down but also 
uh, as far as like apostleship and all that, everyone knows exactly who the next prophet's yeah. going to be. It's if very orderly and very audience. organized. Everyone so, knows what's going to happen. So yeah. with the Kingston group, if he's the prophet and there's these four other men, do they are they called counselors? Are they called apostles? And are there any apostles? Well, I was just thinking of it if like if you're trying to compare it to the LDS Church, it's like the LDS Church on like steroids, or if someone was creating that while they were on cocaine because <laughs> there's not a lot of structure to it. There's really like I I swear the people just make it up as they go and yeah. they they have the LDS church as like a reference for them to look if they like don't know what to do or like what to label some then I'm sure they look at some of the things that they've done to help with their structure oh. but I really think that they just kind of if they if it's not convenient for them they'll change it however they want cuz just like that with 12 apostles it's like Technically, they have a position that's very similar, but they don't put a number on it because all the numbered men technically are apostles with hmm. that they would consider the same type of classification. And there's a hundred people with numbers in the order. So a hundred people in the order have numbers mm -hmm. and numbers mean what? Basically, it's kind of like your ticket to heaven or they, they hate when we say ticket to heaven because they, <laughs> they, they don't call it that. But if you think about it, that's basically what it is. But they call it just meaning that you have earned your like you're very spiritual you've earned your place in the kingdom of god and like you've like solidified it kind of like so there the right. seems like they're kind of tw twisting the term of a uh, second anointment uh from the mainstream the lds, LDS church second anointment i'm not even sure okay, okay. So Sorry. well i was no, gonna ask fine. before uh -huh. i can compare to whether that's true once you get your number is there anything that you can do to have your number taken away from you oh yeah mm -hmm. it, it, okay. it's almost like like I said, they can do anything, you know, they make up the rules as they go. And they, I think when numbers were first established, it was your ticket to heaven. Like you couldn't get it taken away. You know, you got your place in heaven, but there's with enough time, there's been p numbered men that have disagreed with the prophet and like wanted to change things. And so they have actually taken numbers away from certain people and reassigned them to other people. Okay. Because I was like, if there's a reassignment, that would then, be a little bit different would, than the second anointing. Different, yes. Second anointing in the LDS churches, you have to be in a very high position, normally like apostle or higher. It's very, very selected and mm -hmm. a lot more secretive. A lot of people don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. um, but they go through the temple and there's a special ceremony where they are basically insured a spot in the celestial kingdom. What? But I didn't know this. From what yeah. I understand, wow. um, yeah, okay. you can't, at that point, the only thing that could keep you from yeah. that would be um, becoming a son of perdition, like denying the Holy Ghost, denying the church as a whole, and like completely. Which shine has away. happened. And, and the, you know, so technically it could be taken away from you in, yeah, in some sure, sense of I'm the sure word. I'm sure the person we're talking mm -hmm. about that had gotten the second anointing and then he left the church. I'm sure yeah. he's no longer second anointed. But oh. it's not, I've only ever heard of that happening once ever. But mm -hmm. normally second anointing is only someone that's so high that they're never going to stray from the church. And wow. they have it. So, but I mean, oh. they're not numbered in that way, but it is like a very special and it's for very few number of people mm -hmm. rather than like obviously most people are trying to get to heaven and mm -hmm. don't have a number and they're still going to get there yeah. in LDS. But so similar to, but different, it sounds yeah, like. Do yeah. Do you have mm -hmm. to have a number to get to heaven? To the highest, yeah, the celestial, because they'll yeah. even say that the wives that are married to those numbered men, then because they're married to them, that's kind of their. They connection take, to it take basically. on that number they, they mm -hmm. become a part of him yeah they've even taken it farther now they never taught this when i was in the kingston group but now they're even saying if your husband's number is like 40 and you're the first wife yours would be like 40.1 or something they're like they're like letting them give themselves like a, number, a number kind of yeah mm -hmm. but i've never heard of that before until recently so a way to let the women feel like they have a number without really having a number. Yeah. <laughs> you think it to be a point one on somebody else's number. <laughs> so if you don't have a number, is there, a, is there this feeling around your church, your old church, <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that you are not going to receive all the blessings, that you're kind of left out of the elite group? Uh, or are you just trying to get like, to the point where you can get that number? Are yeah, you? it's kind of like if you don't have a number, you can you can't retire. You can't like relax. You you should constantly be going to priesthood classes. You should be constantly serving within the church, doing everything within your power to become righteous enough to. So everyone's get a trying to get a number then. All the guys, yeah. Okay. All the girls, I guess, maybe are too, but just through marriage, I suppose. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. kind of. It sounds more like the equivalent of priesthood, really. Right. Than, mm -hmm. um, 
but they, they do have, have the priesthood. Yeah, and okay. the priesthood, they make it way harder to get than in the LDS religion. You do have to not only just go through all the, the classes, but you have to get approved to get the priesthood as well. You can't just go through the classes, graduate, get the priesthood. Like the, I'm not sure who approves it, but there's people that go through all the classes that for years try to get the priesthood and they just don't. See, oh, that, wow. that's where it's getting more similar to the FLDS. Uh, the okay. FLDS, that was kind of the same way. I was 18 when I left, and I was still a deacon. Oh, and a deacon age wow. is normally 12. Mm-hmm. So I received the like position of a deacon, but I guess I was never good enough after that. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, it, and you they, were a good kid, though, so well, that's surprising. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> a little bit of rebellious. <laughs> For the most part, I tried to be, but... But yeah, it was uh, interesting. It seems like they tried to chalk it all up to revelation. Mm-hmm. Like, when you're ready, God will speak to me. Like, mm-hmm. that's what the leaders kind of made it seem like. Yeah. yeah. So that in, mo- a, in a similar way, that's why I think it is. You can go to priesthood classes for years and years and not get it. Because they try to make it seem more of like, it'll come when it when it comes. You know, when it's meant to be. When, you're when, ready. when the stars align. You can't just work for it and get it, essentially. And did they, they have the like. multiple steps of priesthood? Did they have deacons, teachers, priests, and then the Melchizedek? Yeah, but from it's been a long time. And for me, I've never taken the priesthood classes. So in the order anyway. Okay. And so I don't know exactly how they do it. But I do know they acknowledge the differences and they they know about them. But from my understanding, they don't like have anything super special or different. It's like once you get the priesthood, you kind of just have all of them. You either have the priesthood or you don't. Oh. Oh. They don't. They acknowledge the different levels of it, but I don't think they have like... Oh, you get this one, and then you'll get this one, and then you get this one. You just kind of, you know, you you work your way up until you get the priesthood, and then you one have and the done. Priesthood. And did they? I, mean, have I guess a t- it's I guess it's less work, less. Mm-hmm. less. Well, I think it's the, in their head, it's still the same amount of work. You just have to get through all of them to get any. But I mean, as far as like ordaining people in different offices, yeah, well, and oh yeah, that, that's true. Less, like, less ceremonies, interviews. less yeah, ceremonies. Less just interviews, when you're ready, then sure. then you're ready, and we'll just give everything one dose. Here you did, go. Did they have a typical age for that? Like what was there a typical age where okay now I'm I'm old enough to take the classes to be able to start that journey or do you take classes from like being a young boy all the way until they say you're worthy? Um technically it starts when you're young but it's just it's only called like Sunday school class when you're little and it's weird even in the Sunday school class with each year that you're in they they would call it like there's a Sunday school class that's called the Stripling Warriors or something like that and um, that's a certain age group and I wonder if to them that's kind of like the deacon category you know but they don't call it the same thing you know they call it the stripling warriors and hmm. so they they almost just have their own twist on a lot of it they change it in their own way because yeah I remember graduating going from different class to class throughout Sunday school and then they once they they only start calling it priesthood classes though once you're I believe 18 or older okay. once you're okay. in those classes which so. would be similar to the Melchizedek so mm-hmm. and Real quick, I just have to say for those of you who have never been LDS or are familiar with any of these religions at all, um, since it feels like the LDS is kind of the middle ground between the two, I will give just a quick introduction to what I'm talking about when I refer to the different levels of priesthood. So in the mainstream LDS church, when you are a 12-year-old boy, then you become a deacon, and that's when you're able to pass the sacrament in church and you have certain responsibilities, um, like you get to go and get fast offerings, and they have certain responsibilities. And then when they turn 14, they become a teacher, and then they have different responsibilities. Every single step is like kind of like what Esco was saying, like a different step in gaining a little bit more responsibility with the end goal. So you have deacons at 12, teachers at 14, priests at 16. That's when they get to um, bless and pa- uh, bless the sacrament. And then you get the Melchizedek priesthood. For most men, it's before they serve a mission, then they become an elder in the church. So that's a little bit different than other religions where elders mean like older <laughs> necessarily, but um, the term elder goes with holding the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the highest priesthood. Now it sounds like, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that your group was just going straight to Melchizedek priesthood and giving you these baby steps without necessarily saying, this is being a deacon, now you're a teacher, now you're a priest. They're just giving you all the way up to Melchizedek as an adult. Is that right? Kinda, and I almost <clears throat> wonder if, not even Melchizedek, because like, I guess I'm not the perfect representative to know about this stuff, but if I were to compa- make the comparisons, I would say you 
you don't even have any priesthood at all until you get to the classes and you graduate from the classes, then you almost get the Aaronic priesthood. And I oh. feel like you don't even get the Melchizedek priesthood in the order unless you get a number. That's kind of how oh. it seems. Kind of the, and Aaronic the is the deacons, teachers, priests. Those are all considered under the realm of Aaronic. Mm -hmm. I might need to do like a little graph or something. But <laughs> yeah, so those first three steps in the LDS church are all the Aaronic priesthood, and then becoming an elder is the Melchizedek priesthood. Mm -hmm. So gaining a number would be considered getting the Melchizedek priesthood. I think so, yeah, because it's kind of <laughs> like they do have some people, because they don't allow anyone to do baptism unless they have the priesthood, right? You, uh, at least in the order. They, then you have to have the priesthood, so you have to have gone through all those classes, gotten the priesthood, and, but then anything like beyond baptisms, then it's always done by numbered men. Numbered men are the ones special enough to do like the marriages and just like, you know, any other ordinances. So I almost feel like that's why I would compare it that way because of the difference of hmm. the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood within like the LDS church is those different ceremonies, you know, the different right. ordinances. Yeah, once again, it seems like the LDS church has everything laid out a little bit more structured than FLDS and the Kingston mm -hmm, group. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, it's just kind of, a, like you said, it seems like that the Kingston group and the FLDS kind of changed things and made things up along the mm -hmm. way. I feel like they want a little bit of mystery because they, I feel like they don't fully know what they're doing, you know? And so <laughs> if they keep a little bit of mystery to it, then people can't connect the dots and be like, oh, you did something wrong or whatever, you know? They can be like, yep. no. That's okay. <laughs> That's how it's supposed That's to be. That's how it's supposed so, to be. Yeah. Surprise. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. So uh, really quick, and then we can move on from this, but uh, are there a hundred men? Are there a hundred numbered men? There's oh. more, but it's tough though, because once you get a number, you keep it forever. Until okay. even after you're dead. Oh, I thought so. you said there was a number. I thought like a hundred only. Well, I no, I I'm pretty sure it's up to a hundred and fifty. Okay. Of so the people far. that's been assigned. So is there far. a certain number where it has to stop? Like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that there's only a certain number. Is it hundred thirty three thousand? I forget the exact number. Hundred sixty something thousand. Well, if you in think the it's almost range. been a century that the Kingston group has been here, and there's only been hundred and fifty numbers assigned. So. There's no way they're going to get that high. <laughs> like, oh, I mean, they word. think they will. If it did take over the whole world like their plan is, then sure. But, you know, if you look at history, it's probably not going to get that high. So there's that many members. You're saying even though a lot of them may be children, about nine to 10,000 members, and there's still mm -hmm. only 150 numbered men. Yep. And, and of hmm. all time, even of the dead people, too. So, so wow. these numbers are given so out this is a very rare. Big deal to get a number. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. So, what happens to the men? You said that's the highest degree of glory. What happens to the men who die without getting a number? So, they are they not able to reach the celestial kingdom, or is it only for the highest degree? Well, according to the order doctrine, if they live plural marriage and did everything right, then technically they can without a number. But it probably just means like they. They didn't do as much as they could have done in this life. Because technically they say you can go to the celestial kingdom as long as you're living righteously, as long as you live the plural marriage and the laws and stuff like that. And there's people that do that. They live all of the laws and the rules that the order sets up, but don't have a number. So mm. I'd imagine they can. It's just if you have a number, it's more like guaranteed you'll go to the celestial kingdom. Without that number, then it's, you know... It's a lot more work risky, constantly. I guess, maybe, or something. <laughs> yeah. Still up in the air. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. So Interesting. Wow. Uh, going back real quick to your childhood just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I know we're going to go off on a doctrine good. tangent. Good. That's good. Um, but coming back to your childhood, um, did you... I, I've heard that the Kingston group is a lot more like social with the outside world. Like the FLDS are pretty closed off. Did you have a lot of interaction with the outside world? Did you know that your family was different right away? Or like at what age did you realize I might be raised in something different than mm -hmm. most people? I think compared to the FLDS, then yeah, we were more involved with the outside world. But it's only because the FLDS is completely cut off, you know? <laughs> the, the Kingston group still is very their own thing, you know? Uh, they try to keep everything as separate as they can. Where I think it's different is the Kingston group is kind of like they want the world to accept them really badly because they want to take over the world, you know? And so I think... In, in the, mission, through missionary work? Or what do you mean by take over the world? Uh, I mean, they don't have missionaries, so I don't know how, but they plan to take over the world. You know, like, <laughs> that sounds sketchy. It's, it's part of the mission statement, but we don't really have a plan to get there. <laughs> exactly. That, that's literally what it is. They, they say, even in the beginning, they technically had a couple of missionaries for the Kingston group, because they were just kind of copying the LDS, right? It's just it's doing the same thing. 
But when they got so basically couldn't convince anybody, uh. <laughs> then they stopped. And a lot of the members were like, no, missionary work's a big deal. What are we going to do? And then conveniently, they got a revelation saying, uh, we don't want to convince people to join us. God will send the people to us that are meant to be. And so it just mm. conveniently worked out for them <laughs> to not have missionaries anymore. Interesting so. how it's interesting how revelation works that way, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever whatever's mm-hmm. most convenient for the person receiving the revelation, that's what mm-hmm. that's what happens. There's probably a little bit of that in every single religion's history. Yeah. I know mm-hmm. for sure yeah. in our three groups. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so going back to you growing up, mm-hmm. just a little bit. So you, what about schools? Did you were you mixed in with the other people, or did you have your own schools in, in this church? Well, they strongly encouraged to go to the Kingston school that they have. When I was growing up, they only had a, an elementary school and a junior high. So then high school, you would just have to, you know, mingle, like go to an outside school and figure it out. Hmm. Or they would encourage you to do homeschool and stuff like oh, that. Okay. And so they would try their best. And now they do have a high school. Who knows how long that'll last for because it's kind of going through a lot of heat right now. But because mm. they won't let any black people into the schools. But uh. anyways, <laughs> oh, yeah. Gosh. So, uh, but but they try their best to have their own schools, have their own jobs, workplaces, everything you need so you don't have to um, interact with them very much. But I almost feel like they, they try to teach their members how to dress like the regular people, how to like get along in the outside world so that we can't, they, so that they can, you know, kind of like bring people on if they need to or like I guess blend in well or something they get can along claim, with the world I feel like too when there's groups like that they it, it gives this um sense of like we're not that strange mm-hmm. right like if we kind of blend in more I mean oh, yeah. they took pride in being different than all the rest of the world that, mm-hmm. that was that was what the te- the I guess leaders of the church of the FLDS would constantly talk about how it was important to be different than everyone else. Yeah, but that's not very helpful mm-hmm. if you're going to take over the world. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. right. If, you, <laughs> so. if you want your group to take everyone, you know, become all of Utah, then it's like they have to uh, be appealing, I feel like, to a lot of the people. And, it, and it's weird because, like, polygamy is not going to be appealing at all. So they, I think they try to be appealing in other ways maybe or something like that. Okay. I'm not sure So were you exactly. homeschooled mm-hmm. in high school or what was your schooling personally like? Yeah, so I really did want to go to a public school and to have more like social interaction. So I got lucky enough that in it was eighth grade, I went to a public school and made some outside friends. That was when I made my very first um, black friend, actually. And it was weird because I knew that the, the Kingston group was racist and that they didn't like him, but it almost made me want a black friend to kind of like figure it out, you know? So I remember yeah. having this black friend in my in my class and I was like, I couldn't stop looking at him. <laughs> I was like, I wanted to go and play with him at recess and I wanted to like get to know him because I was like, why do they think these people are so different, you know? And yeah. meeting him, I was like, we became friends so fast because, oh, you know, good. we were both young. We were both into the same like sports and stuff. And, and I remember it like, I kind of forgot that I was supposed to be racist and I invited him over and my mom was just kind of like super hesitant and like, I, I, I it was just a weird situation. And that's when I realized that like something was up and, and I don't like it, but I remember knowing that like, okay, I can't really bring my black friend around my, my order member friends and stuff like that. So, so what was, what did they tell you the reasoning was, so I'm guessing there are no black people allowed in the religion mm-hmm. or was it any minorities or just blacks? No, anyone like they, they don't have any, they technically they have whites and they have, um, Indian, but that's it. The only like Indian races. Native Americans, like Native Americans, Native American. Yeah, sorry. okay. Mm-hmm. No, you're fine. Yeah. Um, but so, what did they tell you? The reasoning was, uh, just some like pure blood thing. I feel like they don't talk about it too much, which is odd because I think they realize how rude it sounds, maybe or something. But I just remember being told that they're different. They're the fence sitters. All sorts of different stories mm. about them. You know, they're this and that. Just, just don't intermingle with them. I was just like. And I already was at school, so I was like, well, too late for that, I guess. So, yeah. I don't know. So, interesting. at your home school, or no, sorry, at the, at the high school you said they have now, mm-hmm. you said that they are not allowing uh, people of color uh, to come and join or anyone that's not, I guess, in the Well, in the- first of all, 95% of it is just Kingston's. First okay. of all, um, because they're trying to get public funding and stuff, they do have this enrollment process for, for anyone to sign up. Oh. And every once in a while, randomly, people do sign their kids up for it and stuff. And what they do is they kind of, they still get to filter a little bit. And so far, there's only been white people and there's been like one um, Hispanic. 
Okay. And that's it so far. And that's what a lot of the, the news media is getting on them about, saying that it's in West Valley. West Valley is known for tons of like different Diversity. ethnicities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they only have white people in the school. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so yeah. they're seeing issues with it for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I can see definitely that it could be a problem. I'm just mm-hmm. surprised. Based on coming from the FLDS, I'm surprised they're allowing anyone to join their school. I was just going to say, I'm surprised they're trying to get public funding. Like, it sounds like they have plenty of money, so... (laughs) That is the odd thing, but it's millions of dollars, though, that they're getting from the state. And they use that throughout the whole um, Mm. church, basically. And Mm. and it even goes, like, I don't know how much of this I should say, because I've learned about this recently, but, like, they get public funding for food, right? They use that public funding to start a... Uh, a bakery basically within in the group within the church and then they use that to feed a lot of the members like most of the food doesn't even go towards the school stuff that which the that public was funding for is for lunches. exactly yeah uh-huh. oh. and they so they basically just abuse everything that they get towards them and it's just that i think that's the only reason why they're asking for public funding just to get more money it's all about profit they're man. gonna go down for that kind of stuff it'll, though. it'll, it'll, bite, them, it'll bite them in the butt eventually for sure oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Gonna, it's gonna be the yeah. law, the law will we, catch up. We've seen mm-hmm. that happen in the FLDS, and if you're not, I mean, it's just kind of super. I'm not kind of. It's very frustrating to see churches take advantage mm-hmm. and, and break the law and do all these things all the time. It seems like it happens a lot, and it's almost like a quote there because I remember constantly growing up, it was a joke to be like, "Well, if we followed the law, then we wouldn't be here." So it's kind of like we're above the law, you know. Uh. And a lot of them have that mindset. And I think that's really going to screw them over in the future. So, Do you think the main thing that they're talking about when they're saying, like, we want to be here is the polygamy? Or well, do you yeah, think it's polygamy is illegal. And they like 90% of them are from a second, third or fourth wife, you know. Mm-hmm. And so they wouldn't be there. Yeah, if it wasn't for polygamy. Because I feel so. like I feel like the um, the clinging to the polygamous lifestyle and that being illegal for so long and all the different splinter groups that have ha- happened from the LDS over polygamy. I feel like that always gives like the first initial like sense of being above the law because right. that's been happening for so long that mm-hmm. they've been persecuted for that, that now it's like, well, if I have this huge thing that is so doctrinal, then it doesn't matter well, if we cut these other corners. And it, and, it has, and it started back in Joseph Smith's day, like way back when it's, that's why now churches try to justify it by saying, well, Hey, like the FLDS, for example, that's exactly what Joseph was dealing with, persecution. He had to he had to be above the law because it was God's law. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's something that's, that's used. Uh, people will just blame it. Well, it's been happening for hundreds of years, so we're okay. Mm-hmm. And not only that, as growing up, I felt like the way they would describe even the government a lot was basically this big old evil man or whatever, you know, this evil group. Mm-hmm. And so, like, the government isn't their friend. They would talk really yeah. bad about it and just... So the laws are made by the government, a group that they don't really even like. So they, I guess, don't pay attention to it or something. But huh? Yeah, so well, interesting. Mm-hmm. So going, that, so when, that happens a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. when you started going to high school, so you went to two years, right? Is that what you said? Well, and it was, or did you wasn't finish straight. High school? So I went for eighth grade. Uh, oh, sorry, sixth grade and then eighth grade, and then that was it. So two years of public school okay. was all that I really got, and I made. Lots of friends. And it, it was so good for me. I don't like telling people online that it was the best. And it taught me a lot about the outside world and helped me to leave. Because then I know order members are going to be like, okay, my kids are not going to public <laughs> school. But I'm like, oh, it, it was so good for me. And it just helped me to see what it was like and to understand how basically weird the order was doing things oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Well, so was so. that the first time? I mean, so sixth and eighth grade, that's still pretty young, right? You're... Mm-hmm. Yeah. How old? Like 11 and 13-ish? Somewhere in there? Yeah. You're preteen, right? Is mm-hmm. that the first time that you realized that like your community was different and that your family was different and that something was up? Did it feel pretty normal up to that point, the way that you were living? Oh, yeah. And in fact, even in sixth grade, it, I did, it didn't fully register with me because I remember wanting to tell my outside friends, I have three moms. Like, it's no big deal. But... First of all, they didn't understand that when I did tell them. And if my mom ever heard me saying that, she'd be like, whoa, don't don't go telling people that. Yeah. You know? like, keep it hush hush, stuff like that. But like I was only like 11 and I was like, what? It's fine. I mean, I have three moms. I, I feel like that's okay to tell people about that. And I would even want to take it further. And like sometimes my friends would be like, oh, yeah, we're Mormon. And I'd be like, oh, we're true Mormons <laughs> and stuff like that. So it's like, we're like the same, but I'm just a little bit better than you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I know. I was like, both of you guys are better well, than we were. Actually, it seems like you uh, 
you guys were more okay with the Mormon church, like the main FLDS, mainstream church? I think so. Like, uh, I did hear my dad be like, oh, that's the church of the devil. Oh. Uh, but, oh. but he would reference it sometimes and be like, yeah, we're just the more true Mormons, you know, like, like we're not that different, but like we're, we're going the right way. They're going the wrong way, kind of. Interesting. Um, okay. But. Because obviously, coming from the FLDS, it was very much, they are the great wicked, abominable. great and abominable <laughs> church, uh, mm -hmm. church created by the devil, by the devil. And they're, they uh, have left the true path that we're supposed to be on and okay. so so they would mm -hmm. there was That's a lot of negativity mm -hmm. towards that and a lot more this is the true church now and so mm -hmm. it sounds like it was okay. kind of similar and yeah mm -hmm. very similar and i feel like the the kingston group considers every other religion kind of like the church of the devil because if you're not the right one then you're the wrong one well oh. the book of mormon <laughs> says that mm -hmm. that there's the one in true church and that mm -hmm. all the others are founded by the devil so i can mm -hmm. see that if it makes either of you feel better, you guys may have thought that my religion was the devil, but we thought you guys were just like like sad wandering souls and that the great and abominable church was the Catholics. So we didn't blame yeah. it on either of you. Every church is, is, bl is blaming the church that's a little bit bigger than yeah. their church yeah. as the great and abominable whoever's, church. Yeah, whoever has that bit, bit more of an engine, uh, more money and more members. They must they be the great and abominable ones. because they have more members, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah. who, can, who do the Catholics get to blame? I don't know. Well, the cat. I think they're the top dogs. Well, the Catholics don't have the teaching of the Great and Abominable Church, so mm -hmm. I guess I guess I guess it stops there. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Oh, off track. Off track. Yeah, off track. Um, so you're going to so you're recognizing that, and then when um, at what point did so you were homeschooled for high school? Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. For um, ten, eleven, and twelfth grade. For eleventh or for ninth grade. Um, in Utah, they do it differently. Ninth grade is technically high school, and but you're still at the middle school for ninth, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh huh. So, yeah, and then for all of the high school years, I did do homeschool, and I did it all in one year because the order is all about like get school done with and then work and stuff. Mm. And so I did all of those high school years in one year, and I didn't learn a thing. I just you know <laughs> I did the homeschool stuff, just filled out all the stuff, took all the tests. Basically Not just got diploma. my GED or whatever. I did get my diploma, yeah. And then the sad thing is I should have went straight into college, but I was so focused on, you know, making money and like my dad being proud of me, saving and putting money towards the family. So I just worked for two years straight, just working. And that was it. And I was like, man, it felt really mundane. And I was getting paid like $7 an hour, like nothing. It was just mm. really, mm. really a bummer. What yeah. kind of work did um, the people in the Kingston group do? So they try to like entrepreneurs and, and branch off to all sorts of things they have grocery stores I I waxed the grocery stores uh, floors for a long time I worked at the Western shop that they have there selling cowboy boots and stuff like that oh, okay um, and then I also did oh and one of my half brothers started his own company and I got to work for him for a little while and that was pretty cool just kind of jumping from job to job because I don't really didn't know what I was doing. Really. Was so. it was it pretty typical to work only for companies owned by Kingston Group members? Yeah, in fact, there was a couple of times because I thought it would just be so cool to be like a car salesman or just to you know try one of the cool jobs that it looks like out there from the outside perspective looks awesome. And I mentioned that to my dad, and he was like, "Well, maybe one day when the order gets a car dealership or something." Like, like to him, it wasn't even a question. You don't, you don't ask to work for an outside job. You just wait till the order has what you want, and then you work there and stuff. So it's interesting. Like, yeah. So not as much construction then. Not that I know of. I know now they're getting more into it. They have like a cement company, a okay. um, roofing company, and stuff like that. But like, it just whatever comes up i guess so interesting yeah i mean the, the flds was very much into construction to be number one self-sufficient mm -hmm. number two to not have to necessarily i mean they would leave the community to work you know to go to their jobs and stuff but they wouldn't have to mingle with the outsiders as much if oh, they were it's if their they own were, business kind of huh? it's their own oh, business okay. and they're just going and building a house or doing that mm. something and they're not having to actually go work in a grocery store for example and mingle mm. with other employees that aren't from the actual mm. church well that's where the order did it differently because if they wanted to work in a grocery store they'd buy the grocery store <laughs> and have it be theirs and only order members would be working there and stuff like that would outsiders hmm. be allowed to shop there though yeah yeah okay. i mean because of I think laws and regulations, they had to have yeah, it open yeah. to the public. But it was pretty rare. Like, it's a small little grocery store, and it's like, 
not nice at all. It's not like Walmart where they like keep it up and maintained and, and like Walmart's not that nice to the regular people, but like to us, it's way nice because we're used to just having like small crappy things and like saving money, you know, don't waste your money if you can save it and if it, the, it's practical and it works, you know, so. So yeah. would, let, I'm just curious how well you blend it in. In, in as the Kingston group, how well you blend it into the normal outside person. Like mm -hmm. if I wa or if anyone walked into your a <laughs> store story. owned by the Kingstons, would would they be, would they instantly be able to tell? Okay, something's different here. Or did no, you? No, I think it takes a little bit more time, but not much though. A lot of people that know John's Marketplace, the grocery store, they like if they've been there, they know that it's a little bit off and odd. But it's not like super noticeable. You okay. wouldn't know right, right away. And you would most likely think that it's like, oh, maybe it's got a bad manager or like, you know, just a weird um, marketing team or something. Yeah, just a weird <laughs> like, vibe more uh -huh. than like thinking a religion's running it. Yeah, you would huh. you would instantly think, oh, this is ran by a cult. <laughs> but, but, but everyone dresses the same as normal. Like no one, you, you don't have a special kind of uh, dress code. Nope. I mean, in the schools they do, but not not within just your day to day activities huh. at all. So was that the same for the girls as well? For in the school for the uniforms? I know, yeah. just like in general, just did the, the girls the, have the a clothing they wore. No, code they or? could just kind of wear whatever. They were always told to like dress modestly and stuff like that. But as far as I understand, in the beginning when the Kingston group first started, it was they tried a simplicity uniform, and they were known as blue coats because they always just wore blue jeans and like a, a t shirt or whatever. Uh, like blue overalls, I think it was. And in the beginning, they tried that, and then it quickly died off, and people just started wearing their own hmm. things. And so, what about if this is too sensitive, you don't have to answer it, but what mm -hmm. about any underwear, undergarments, anything different than normal, or was it just normal? I wasn't in long enough to fully know about that kind of stuff because I know they have, um, they teach about the garment, but okay. from my understanding, they only put it on the numbered men when they die for some reason. Okay. So they bury them in special garments, but other than that, there's nothing. So if there is something, it's nothing that's talked about. Exactly. At least yeah. with the general mm -hmm. church. Okay. Yep. And then, sorry, one more doctrinal thing before <laughs> we go back to yours, just because mm -hmm. I'm so intrigued. But obviously, where um, you know both groups splinter off from the mainstream LDS, and you're kind of talking about how the numbered men—that's what gets you to heaven. Well, in the mainstream LDS church, it's all about going to the temple and receiving your covenants in the temple and making those covenants. Mm -hmm. So did you guys have temples? That's and, a really good one. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I think I might know that you probably didn't, but mm -hmm. how did they kind of reconcile that with everyone in the fact that like in early church history, it was very important to Joseph mm -hmm. Smith. And like, what did they tell you about that? This is where you get into a lot of inconsistencies in the Kingston group because I literally, I remember going with my dad and walking on Temple Square, right? In Salt Lake City, seeing the big LDS temple and like, wow, this was basically like in my head, this was built by Joseph Smith, one of our prophets. Like, this is so cool. And then I would ask questions about it and be like, wait, it's, it's not ours though? And my dad would be like, well... It kind of sort of is our temple and it's like, it's like, it's our spiritually and like, we'll probably own it one day, you know, once we take over the world and stuff. But right now it's not fully ours. <laughs> and that's kind of like how he would explain it. And it's like, cause they have to acknowledge temples and their importance and the significance, yeah. but they don't have any that are physically theirs. But I mean, they kind of teach that the temples are supposed to be the orders and the LDS people kind of stole it from them or something. I don't know. That's but, so, so intriguing. So, okay. So obviously they believe in Joseph Smith, mm -hmm. Brigham Young. Yeah, pretty much. Where, where, where did the break off, where did the break off happen? Like at which In profit? doctrine, it's uh, Wilford Wordruff, you know, once, okay. once oh, okay. that uh, manifesto came out, <coughs> but they never teach about Brigham Young. They, they basically teach about um, Joseph Smith and then um, Brother Ortel, and it just kind of skips all those other people. So but. Brother Ortel, was he the first prophet of the Kingston yeah. group? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, yeah. and was he, um, like how long ago, was this, did he know Wilford Woodruff? Was it, was it at that time when the Kingston church started? Yeah, 1935. Okay. So pretty close, I think, right? Okay. So so he so so the first leader of the Kingston group was probably some type of leader in the mainstream LDS church before they split off, I would assume. Yeah, like he was um, very well known and he was an LDS member. They the the history story talks about him wanting to turn in all of his stuff, right? Wanting to live consecration and live polygamy. 
And the mainstream LDS church said, no, we're not going to do that anymore, but you should still be a member, you know, like, yeah. like as long as you don't teach it, you can technically kind of live it on the side if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, I want to live it openly and like just teach my stuff. And in the history, it said that the LDS church said, okay, like we don't want to just excommunicate you right away. Like we'll give you time. And then something along the lines of uh, Ortel being like, no, like make your decision right now. Like, am I going to be able to live this loud and proud or no? And they essentially said no. So they ex so he asked to be excommunicated or something. Even though the LDS church technically didn't really want to, they still liked him. Like, sounded like he was a great member and stuff. But he was just refusing to be quiet about it. Which is cool. I think that's awesome. Like, he wanted to live true to his teachings and stuff. Which I don't feel like the Kingston group is doing that anymore. Mm. I think they're very hush-hush and they, they try to keep it all secret. They don't live it loud and proud. And I think Ortel was all about that in the beginning. Sounds a lot like Sam's grandfather. It's kind of mm -hmm. the same way. And he went to yep. prison for practicing polygamy. Yeah. And he said, we don't want you here. We'll release you if you just say you're not going to practice it. And he's mm -hmm. like, no, <laughs> I'm going to practice polygamy. It is God's mm -hmm. law. Yeah. And they had to keep him a little longer. And eventually they let him out of prison because they were like, we just don't want to have to deal with you anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not a bad man. Yeah. We don't need you here. We just have to try to enforce yeah, this. I think that yep. in, in today's world, anyone that's doing anything that's illegal is kind of being forced to be a little more hush-hush about it because of social media and, and, and mm -hmm. everything out there these days that it's so easy to spread the word that if you're doing something illegal, you'll probably get shut down. And mm -hmm. so that's probably why a lot of like the FLDS, the Kingston Group, are going a little bit more towards like um, secrecy and a little bit more hush-hush about a lot of mm -hmm. the stuff they're doing. Which is a little bit odd, though, because Utah is getting more and more lenient on the whole polygamy thing. Like, like that last law that passed about it, and it's just like... It's not a felony anymore, right? Yeah, it's like just a misdemeanor or something. And, hmm. and it's like, I think, well... I'm torn because I don't like the idea of polygamy. I would love for it to just stop and everything. But I'm also like, I grew up in it. I don't think it's like the most horrible thing. Uh, right. To me, I think it's the secondary crimes that are even worse than polygamy itself. And I can't help but feel like if the government did kind of regulate polygamy a little bit more, then at least all the dads would pay their child support, you know, at least be able to claim their kids and, and do at least more of the proper legal things worth all of that. But I also don't want to be a supporter of polygamy in any way, right. you know. So it's just it's yeah. it's a tough. You and I, you and I are in the same boat here because it's, mm -hmm. it's tough because we were raised that way, mm -hmm. and so we didn't feel like it was causing a lot of problems, or mm -hmm. you know, we felt like it was fine and normal. Yep. So looking back, I'm with you. I'm like, no, polygamy isn't shouldn't really be. You know, I don't know. It doesn't it's, seem like it's the best thing for people, but it didn't seem like it was that bad growing up in it. Mm -hmm. But you're right. A lot of the stuff that comes along with polygamy is not just the. It's, oh, it's, yeah. not, it's not just polygamy alone. It's everything else that comes along with it that causes all of these big problems. Exactly. Not only that, yeah. I think one of the hardest things for me with polygamy is obviously the secondary stuff, but it's also very hard in almost any polygamous group to distinguish who actually is giving full consent mm -hmm. um, with full amount of information too. So it's like if women are practicing polygamy, like there's now, I think a lot of the, the laws are getting looser because there's so many people who are practicing polygamy or polyandry and they don't try to get married, right? But like, so which one's more respectful? A guy saying, okay, I'm taking on three wives and I'm gonna take care of my family or a guy who has one wife and also has three mistresses on the side, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. I would respect the man who has three wives and is taking accountability for having that family. Mm -hmm. However, it comes down to me for like the consent in it. Mm -hmm. It's like whether or not those women they may say they're consenting, but if they've been taught their entire lives that that's the only way, like how much of it is coercion and how much of it is consent. And when mm -hmm. you grow up in those atmospheres, yep. it's very hard to step back and say whether or not someone actually wants to be in that or if they've been, I hate using the term brainwashed, but like if they've been brainwashed into that consent. To feel like it's, it's what's best. To feel like it's mm -hmm. what's best for their eternal salvation. Well, that's some pretty heavy load and burden to put on whether or not they're actually consenting. Mm -hmm. But no person can say, well, you're not actually consenting. You know what I mean? So <laughs> mm -hmm. it's such a tricky, well, tricky Well, I topic. love the idea of the age regulation. Even so many order members I talked to, I was like, what could possibly help? 
And they even agree that making sure that no polygamous marriages happen under the age of 18. But yeah. the Kingston group still does that. And I'm like, your own members know that it would be so much safer, so much more reassuring that it's not being forced or anything like that if they would just wait. And it's like, these people can't just wait a year or two before. If it's supposed to be an eternal forever marriage, why are they pressuring and pushing it to be so right now? And it well, shows something's up. You, you, yeah, exactly. It shows I, that I, there's I think, something up. I think we know the answer to that question, though. Mm. Why they're why they're pushing it at such a young well, age. Well, we do, but the Kingston members. <laughs> <laughs> that's what okay, I'm trying okay. to reference. To. <laughs> yeah. You get, if you let if you let someone get older to the point where they're starting to make their own decisions, they're very likely to either move out or say, "No, actually, I don't want to marry this person." So once they get older and start having their own opinions, mm -hmm. I feel like that is a lot. Lot of the a lot of the time that is the reason why they are kind of forcing it a little bit younger so they're not at that age where they can make their own decisions well, and or, legally, or disagree and legally be able to leave too because people exactly. don't think about the fact especially i mean it's already hard enough for a woman especially if they haven't been able to get outside jobs and things like that it's already hard mm. enough for a woman to leave a situation and to leave her family and her home Oh, yeah. But then you add on top of that, if they're under 18, it's like nearly impossible for them to be able to get away legally. And if they do, the not having any assurance as to what their life is going to look like or how they're going to receive help or do any of those things. Yeah, yeah it definitely very, is. Very, very difficult. Very difficult. And just so they know, though, it's not impossible. I know many people that have done it, but it's true. It's so much harder and the order members know that, and I feel like that's the why good thing. It. And this is kind of what I say to all of the, our viewers, and possibly some from the FLDS Church that are watching, mm -hmm. is at least now you know that you can come to us. Like there's 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 so many people that have left now. There's always somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. There's always yes. someone someone to turn to and say, Hey, how did you do it? How did you figure it out? And then we can help them get on their feet, mm -hmm. right? So it's there's always that hope that uh, you're not going to be completely on your own. And that's a yep. huge reason why we continue to do this. You know, we started off just wanting to share some of Sam's stories for like our posterity, yeah. but we've continued to do it really just more as a platform to let people know that there is help. And obviously, mm -hmm. you doing that, people will know like with your channel, yeah. Eskel Grant, E S K E L. <laughs> Look him up yeah. if you are from the Kingston group. But I'm, you know, what I mean, like there's so many resources. Mm -hmm. And I feel like both, I don't know how it is in the Kingston group, but I, I'm guessing it's probably similar in both groups, that part of it, part of the fear and the scariness of leaving is not realizing how many resources, not even just in people, but like there's government resources, there's holding out help, there's mm -hmm. these other organizations that can help you yeah. get an education, get a job, get on your feet. There's so many resources out there that a lot of times nobody knows when they're in it. They don't know what kind of, help there really is for them right. when they leave mm -hmm. yep and it's scary i understand that it's, it's not yeah. it's not easy to leave behind everything you've been taught everything you know and just changing your life it's it's not yeah, an easy that's thing that's the harder part because a lot of people like you can leave and even if you have no money like if you believe in what you're doing you'll find a way to make it work mm -hmm. but so many people here have been raised their entire childhood their whole life and that's the hardest thing to convince themselves that this is really what they should do or that what they're in isn't right because it's mm -hmm. so much easier to be like i was lucky enough to be born in god's kingdom you know like that's what we're this told is awesome that's what yeah. i was told too <laughs> interesting we're that, the lucky ones interesting there are so many different religious groups that all feel the same way yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the entire world is so lucky <laughs> that's what it feels like so um, all right, so very interesting. Back, so schooling, it look, you did two years. Uh, did you want more schooling or did, were you okay going out and starting to work at this point? Well, to be honest, like for me personally, I was so focused on the money. I was like, I'm just going to work as much as I can. I want to mm -hmm. make so much money so that like my dad's proud of me so that I can start a family. I can have everything that I need. Then I, when I realized $7 an hour is not going to do that, <laughs> that's when I was like, shoot, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> like, I got to figure something out. Yeah. And that's when I started looking into going to college and stuff like that. Okay. So, so you started looking into going to college while you were still in the Kingston group? Yeah, actually. I did my very first semester right before I left. Oh, so, so they were okay with that. They encouraged or at least yeah, would allow for guys, college? Yeah, it's a lot easier. Yeah, I was just like 
telling him that I want to do like I even told my dad I was like dad I want to be like you I want to go to the U I want to graduate mm, okay <laughs> and stuff like that and so way to yeah, pull on his heartstrings <laughs> I want to be just like you dad <laughs> <laughs> um, but it worked at what um, were you guys allowed to date and were marriages arranged because as you said like I want to mm-hmm. be able to have a family obviously mm-hmm. that's very important and all yeah well yeah, bring up the family like, yeah. what did that look like did you did you get to date. Um, no, but I'm really glad we talked about the priesthood thing though, because it's kind of like that. It's like, there's really? a little bit of mystery to it and it's more of like, oh, when God allows it, it's going to happen. You know, so it's arranged it's very... marriages. Does the prophet decide? Well, the prophet has to approve of it. And it's like, I would consider them arranged marriages. Like if you look at it from an outside perspective, yes, they're very arranged, but they get away with saying, oh, it's not arranged because technically I could have gone forward on anyone. But they would just say no, 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 and tell us the one they want. <laughs> but oh, so okay. to me, it's very arranged. But they they have a process that makes it look like you have a say. And it's kind of like how my sister Amanda talks about this all the time. They won't just say you have to marry this person, but they'll put like two people in front of you and be like, you get the choice, you get your free agency, <laughs> but choose one of these two, you know, or something like, like that. Free agency. <laughs> but if I were you, I would choose him. Exactly. Yeah, so they even take it farther, and and yeah, they put something in your head. To make you decide yeah, exactly. yeah, I've, definitely, I've definitely seen that even in the LDS like yay for agency you get the choice but it needs to be the right choice mm-hmm. because if it's not the right choice then none of it is worth it yeah. and you're like well I appreciate the choice but is there yeah, a it's choice? A tr- a free agency is a tricky word but <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that's for another video yeah a whole other video mm-hmm. um, but I just wanted to back up just a little bit you said I'm glad we talked about the priesthood for all of you that don't know what priesthood is basically the simple terms is it is power of God given to man on earth. That's that's really mm-hmm. what it is. And uh, the men that receive it in these churches, in the LDS church, the FLDS church, the Kingston group, and lots more that are break-offs from the LDS church, all have this thing they call priesthood. And it's them mm-hmm. claiming to have the power of God on earth here to do his work and be able to perform miracles and that type of thing marriages mm-hmm. baptisms all of that so that's that's in a nutshell we could go into a lot more of that in a nutshell is what priesthood is is that yeah. kind of what it was like in the kingston group as well mm-hmm. okay. exactly and that's why i relate it to the marriages a little bit because it doesn't matter your age it doesn't matter like really what's going on like if the prophet wants you to marry someone or wants you to have the priesthood you're gonna have it like it's just gonna, that yep. he's the deciding factor did you have so. to have the priesthood okay so you had to have the priesthood to gain a number mm-hmm. yeah did you have to have the priesthood to get married so you no no mm-hmm. okay people oh okay so you could get married but you couldn't perform marriages yeah you can't perform them yeah you can't you perform the like and like that's the weird thing is like the order kind of believes in a lot of the ordinances and like things that you use the priesthood for but they rarely do them you know there's marriages and baptisms but those were the main ones in fact it wasn't until a year after i left that they even had the sacrament prayer for the first time so oh, wow. it's like they they are implementing more and more and i think as they study the scriptures and realize oh god's kingdom oh we missed that one this. <laughs> yeah and they add it and stuff highlight like that. So, get that in the next meeting sacrament and, prayers to well, continue they only do it once a year too so oh really like, oh. Mm-hmm. yeah they do it wow. around easter or something like that so do they yeah, um do they teach from all four scriptures that are the canon lds scriptures like mm-hmm. the bible book of in Martin, fact they even Doctrine purchased them the from Christmas. lds stores and stuff oh, like that okay from so, desert book yeah mm-hmm. okay you know, so as you guys are like learning and reading about those things did anyone ever ask the question like why don't we do this like why don't we do the sacrament why don't we like were those questions asked often or did you yeah, just know no, you couldn't really ask them no i think they were asked but they kind of always had a go-to answer for mm-hmm. things like that and so they had been they, asked these questions probably a hundred times mm-hmm, before so yeah. they, they have their go-to answers mm-hmm. yep. yep yep they definitely had things they would say and like counter questions to put on you and my my least favorite was when i'd ask a question and they'd answer it with the question that would just like confuse me and stuff but oh, so the religious yeah. leaders and politicians huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah but like oh, in an organization like that it's like it seems so much like there is a ladder for power and so many people it i don't i don't want to call it like politicians because it is different and like i'm not into politics so i don't know how everything works but i could not help but feel like even their 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 own brothers you know and they're all trying to like get something out of each other like i couldn't help but feel like my dad was just a pawn in either his brother's hand or like some of the other leaders hands and stuff like that and to me that like felt so weird you know my dad just does anything that these 
godlike people do, I guess, you know? Yeah. Is your really father weird. one of the five men? Or no. is he a brother of one he's of the men? He's the brother of one of the five men. Oh, he, okay. Well, he's the brother, the half-brother of the prophet himself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you're all pretty closely related out there, right? Yep. Because mm-hmm. they, they believe in keeping it like... Uh, yeah, the sacred blood. In fact, they even believe that I think it's all of them have a line that can be traced back to Jesus Christ himself. So they think they've got Christ's blood in them. They may have added a few people along the way just to make the connections, <laughs> but but they well, have it all on somehow. they have it all on paper right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So how old were you the first time you had a question or a doubt about how you were being raised? Um, I think in my mind probably when I was about twelve or thirteen because. I remember before then, my dad was a god. Like, he could do no wrong. Like, I would want to do anything I could to spend time with him. I wanted him to love me so bad, you know? And he's rarely home. He's got so many other kids. So it felt like competition. I I had to compete with all my siblings. And then, though, I do remember there was a time when one of my siblings had gotten beat by him. And ever since then, I was like, wow, okay, this guy... He's me. <laughs> like like my, my whole thought process of him changed. And I was like, okay, so if he's not the godlike person that I thought he was, then maybe my own belief system is wrong. Or like maybe I don't fully understand this world I'm in as much as I, as I thought I did. Mm. But I never said anything because I was always like, you know, our mom would talk about our dad like so great. And like in church meetings, they'd always say the father is the, the you should respect him. He's the greatest and all this stuff. But then that made me question their teachings even more because I was like, but I want a different dad or something. You know, I want I want a change. And they would keep teaching that 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 doesn't happen. Like you just need to love your father, honor your father and your mother. And so that really started having me question without telling anyone that I was questioning. And then once I became about 16 or 17 is when I finally started questioning and talking because my sisters would talk to me about their questioning of the church and that's when i finally realized like wow we can we can question things like we can actually voice our opinions which we we weren't supposed to but at least within my close friend groups then i could trust them enough to share so did oh no 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 you're fine i was just gonna say and it it makes it so much easier when someone else starts their question to you like oh Mm -hmm. i'm not the only one i'm not the only one let's talk about this Mm -hmm. right yeah Yeah. and that was a huge relief to me because i thought i was just gonna take it to my grave and just never talk about it never question things just always do what i was told because that's just how i was raised and then when i finally had the opportunity to share it with others i was like wow this feels right you know like i need to get this out off my chest and stuff like that so wow so did amanda leave a long time before you or pretty not super long but about two years three years before me around there okay okay so she had been out for a little bit and i assume you were probably talking with her about her experience after leaving and all of that not at first oh my god i was scared of amanda at first because (laughs) when she first left then instantly she went from like my loving sister i loved her to death she was awesome super nice to me to Wow, she's an evil person. Because she's she like was fighting doing again. all these bad things. She's probably like high on drugs all the time. Mm. Like just being told the worst story. That's that what people were. People, your parents and people from the church were telling you that's what she was doing, exactly. right? You didn't actually and, know that for sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I believed it so quick. And I don't mm. know why. I look back and it's like I was so dumb to know her personally, live with her, see her every day, know her kind heart and who she was, and then think, oh, wow, just because she left the church, she's this horrible person, she's on the street, she's got no money. And I even, there was one night I, I finally just wanted to know. So I snuck out of the house and went and met up with her, and I was like, just told her, I was like, are you really homeless? Are you are you like on the streets? Are you doing drugs? And she was like, what? No. I was like, no way, really? <laughs> <laughs> So that really well, opened my Well, of mind. course, the leaders want to scare you from leaving. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very sad they would com- that they would completely fabricate such horrible lies about someone. Mm-hmm. But a yeah. lot of these really cult-like religions will do that to f- scare people into believing what they want them to believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say the LDS is definitely the most moderate out of these three groups, for sure. You know, <laughs> yeah. by a long shot. Yeah. Definitely nice. the most moderate. And I'd say rather than like such like... Uh, direct fear tactics is like making up stories or something it was always more of like an emotional like they'll just never get to be as happy yeah you know and those i feel like it was almost like a more like a saddened thing when someone would leave the church everybody just felt so sorrowful and i know when we made the choice to leave like i would rather have someone be mad at me than have someone be disappointed in Mm -hmm. me 
And I feel like it, instead of having people mad at me or make up lies or anything like that, it was always just the sense of the disappointment that they had because, you know, they just assume that you can always be so much happier in the church. Right. And so it was never a like a direct like attack type thing, but mm-hmm. definitely like a more emotional heartache, like knowing that you're letting everybody down and that mm-hmm. they all think that you could be happier if you were within it. So it's yeah. interesting to hear like your guys' was so direct and I'm like, oh, yeah. well, more ours emotional. was also so direct because they got away with it for so long and they were doing it with kids. If you think about it, like they are the dumb ones telling us these sob stories, or these lies, straight up lies, because they have done it so many times to kids that are just like, oh, OK, and believe them. So I feel like they get more, you know, um, they tell more lies or they get like more like into it, I guess. Like they'll just say whatever they want that's convenient for them because they're just convincing this little 13 year old kid. You know, it's yeah. like it's supposed to be super easy, but I don't know why. I don't know. It's just interesting the way they do it. But yeah. yeah. So so at, so at what age were you? So at, you were how old when Amanda left? I think I was 15 14 or 15 okay so you were still fairly young young Mm -hmm. teenager and at this point so you met up with her and you realized okay these are actually lies and you at that point what you thought okay maybe i want to leave eventually or what were you oh yeah ever since then i started questioning things i still wouldn't voice my opinion very much because i it's like i didn't want them to give any order members a reason to like talk to me or convince me, you know, Mm. because they already Mm. thought I was just a good follower. No one was going to come to me and be like, oh, the order's so great. You need to stay, you know, and I didn't want to give them a reason to do that to me. So you just played along to myself. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Played along for a while. And then what was the final straw for you? What did your exit look like? I think it was just the fact that like from 16 to 18, right, I was just growing up, living my life. And I was like, I can make this work for me. I don't care if I have to, you know. But put on a face when I go to church, be a little bit not who I truly am. But like, I, I'm okay with that. I can make that work if it was just me involved. But when I would see my younger siblings or really close friends, like especially with my really close friends getting married so young, I had a friend that I grew up by my whole life, going through all the grade schools worth, and he got married at 16. 